I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to my office. I'm a cognitive scientist who studies time travel and retrocausality, which is how the future impacts the present and the past. And today I want to talk to you uh, specifically about a type of time travel that's studied by psychologists, um, which is that humans are unique in their ability to think about both the past, the present, and the future, something that's called mental time travel. Uh, an example will hopefully clarify this for you too. If you go back to our ancestral past, when people were tracking animals on the savanna, they would see a set of tracks, and from that they could determine whether the animal, from the hoof prints if you will, whether the animal was say a buffalo or an antelope, and whether it was by itself or whether it was in a group, um, they could determine how fresh the print was, and so was it recent or was it, you know, from a, a few weeks ago? And they could get a whole bunch of information from that. And then they would be able to track the animal and uh, they would able to foresee, were able to foresee where it was going or in the correct or the proper terminology, they were, they were able to pre-live where they were likely to find that buffalo. And uh, then actually seeing the buffalo and killing it would be uh, reinforcement and then everybody eats and everybody's happy. Now this contra contrasts strongly with the way, let's say a lion hunts. So um, a lion will, actually all animals, will just step over the tracks of another animal. They don't pay attention to them at all. They don't get any information from them. Um, what, the way that they hunt is by stalking their prey. So they actually see their prey and then uh, they essentially charge them and. Um, attack them that way. So it's kind of the smash and grab approach to, um, to hunting. But humans, because we're able to think about the past, where the animal was, in the future, where the animal's going, uh, we're able to be the most successful hunters in the animal kingdom. Now, this comes at a price. Because we can think about the past and future, we can also think, think about how events could have gone differently. So let me give you a more modern example. Um, and this is what psychologists, uh, cognitive psychologists call the mutability of events. Let's say you're shopping, let's say in the downtown area, wherever you are, and let's say you usually drive home down the main street of your town, but it's a nice day and you decide to take a parkway home through the, through the woods. And then you hit a deer. Okay, now you're fine and, you know, the car is total, but you're fine and you begin to think of how things could have gone differently. That if you had gone shopping earlier, you would never hit that deer. Or if you'd driven home the way you usually drive home, you wouldn't have hit the deer either. That's the mutability of events. We think of how things could have gone differently. Now, this is used all the time by, um, in criminal trials, by, let's say, defense attorneys who will ask the victim, um, you know, uh, if you hadn't been walking on that street, would you have, um, you know, run into my client and been robbed? And they say, well, no, if I'd gone a different way, I wouldn't have even seen them. And then the defense attorney will say, well, don't you bear some of the responsibility then by uh, having walked that particular way? So it's, it's ludicrous, but it gets into this idea of how we can event, think of events going very differently. Now, a version of uh, the mutability of events is tied to depression, and that's what's called rumination, that um, people think about all the injustices and indignities and poor ways that they've been treated, and that leads to um, dissatisfaction with their life and relationships and um, a host of other things too. And that's thought to be one of the main causes of depression, that thinking about events that have occurred to you uh, in the past make you depressed in the present. And uh, women are more likely to ruminate, and it's thought to be that um, that's one of the causes for why women are more likely to be diagnosed with depression than men are. So this really fits a, po a pattern that Freud would agree with, that traumas and problems in the past lead to depression in the present. However, uh, we also have to consider the future when we think about these things. And this theory uh, comes from Martin Seligman, who you may or may not be familiar with. He is one of the founders of the idea of positive psychology. 
and he was also president of the American Psychological Association. When he was president, he was asked, he said, he was asked, what's the, could you tell us what the state of psychology is in, um, in one word? And he said, good. And then they said, how about in two words? And he said, not good. And then they said, how about three words? And he said, not good enough. But uh, the types of research that he's run is they will ping people on their cell phone uh, throughout the day, just randomly. And they'll ask them what they're thinking about. Are they thinking about the past? Or are they thinking about the future? Or are they thinking about the present? And what they find is that people are three times more likely to be thinking about the future than they are about the past. And when they do think about the past, they're thinking about it as a guide for the future, for what they should do next. And so his theory is um, that it's people, depressed people think about uh, a negative future, and that's what causes depression. And it's called dysfunctional prospection, uh, is the term that he uses. That, uh, and it's tied to something called self-efficacy, if you've heard of that term. Self-efficacy is the idea of um, how our behavior can lead to positive outcomes, and that people who are depressed tend to be low in self-efficacy. They feel like uh, basically nothing they do uh, will change their future. And so that's Seligman's um, idea about where depression comes from. But that's not the, even though it concerns the future, it's, it's not um, a retrocausal explanation. The retrocausal explanation actually comes from um, two other researchers, um, Lauren Alloy and Lynn Abramson. And in 1979, they came up with the theory of what was called depressive realism. And this is the fact that people who are depressed tend to have a more realistic view of the world than people who are uh, not depressed. Uh, and that really what, because life is a series of, it's suffering, it's indignities, and it ends in death. And so thinking otherwise is being irrationally optimistic about the way the world really works. Um, the way I would think about this, oh, and one other thing too, is people are asked questions about, um, do you think, you know, because there's always shades of gray, but do you think that you are the master of your own fate, or do you think that you're more like a leaf that blows in the wind and reacts to events? Now, it's much more realistic to think that you are a leaf that blows in the wind um, and you're reacting to events because uh, people get hit by cars every day, but nobody puts in their planner, get hit by car on a particular day. And so that's why accidents occur. But um, it's psychologically more healthy to believe that you are the master of your own faith. That is um, self-efficacy. That's believing that your behavior will have some influence on future events. So the retrocausal explanation of this, um, what does that mean? I, I want to use it, an example from romantic relationships. And it's something called negative affectivity. And it's really poisonous in relationships. It's where people are incredibly self-critical. And they're not just critical of themselves and gloomy and have a negative outlook. They're also, they feel that way about family members and people they're in romantic relationships with too. And so they tend to be critical. They point out all kinds of problems that um, other people have. And uh, people don't want to be in relationships with them. And so a lot of times they have failed relationships. So the idea is this, that what they're, uh, it's not that they have negative views of the future. They have realistic views of the future, that their negative affectivity is going to lead to broken relationships uh, where they end up uh, basically alone and unhappy. And so uh, depression, properly understood, is a retrocausal phenomenon, that these people are realistic about their future outcomes. Um, so Martin Seligman, just to go back to him really quick, because I don't want to leave on a negative note, he is the, he came up with the idea of learned helplessness, which um, we don't need to go into. It's, um, it involved research with animals in electrified cages, but he also says that we can have learned optimism where uh, people can learn to expect good outcomes too. But uh, this goes back to the old joke of how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one 
but the light bulb has to want to change. And if you ever work in um, uh, any kind of psychology, you realize the truth of that. So I guess the, to the central point is that depression, properly understood, is a retrocausal phenomena. That people um, are understanding that a future, uh, the future can be bleak if you are, um, if you have a negative outlook on things. If this is interesting to you, I would encourage you to pick up my book, Psychology and Retrocausality. Um, also, I would ask you to um, visit us on the web at retrocausality.org. We're trying to identify people who are retrocausally sensitive. Um, there's also a link below if you'd like to support my research on Patreon. Otherwise, I would ask you to like, subscribe, and share this video. And otherwise, have a great day.